A couple of questions that came in earlier. I think we've got one in terms of, of this area. Um, so it was a, a tenant from um, the city locality um, and it relates to, we saw in the presentation there about um, soundproofing and insulation. So this question is pretty relevant um, and it is want to find out more if Perth and Kinross is monitoring sound and heat insulation between floors. So I think uh, Nicola Lennon is going to take that question. Um, morning. Thank you very much for your question. Um, yes, I think they're related specifically to, to new build, but um, for new properties, our, our properties are built to the current building regulations. So in terms of sound and, um, as you've said, heat insulation, um, energy efficiency, these are set by the building standards and the, the regulations by the Scottish Government. So we do adhere to those. And that includes for um, sound transmission between individual flatted properties. Um, we do have to carry out a sound test on all new properties um, to improve that they do meet the building standard for uh, the sound element. Um, for our existing properties, it is a bit more difficult to, to consider um, the energy efficiency, the heat in terms of the heat um, between properties and also the sound. Um, but we do look at the sound one on a case by case basis, but we haven't had that many over the last 10 years. But for the, the heat side of things and the insulation, we do have programmes of work that target the energy efficiency of the properties. And those are ongoing and we do um, target funding that is available through various schemes that are set up by the Scottish Government as well. Where there is a heat advice team that we work in conjunction with, um, with SCARF um, as a partner, so they can offer our tenants advice on how to improve their own energy efficiency and, and reduce their bills too. Thanks for that, Nicola. Thank you. One other question, and again, um, links in with the, the presentation and uh, links in with the repairs. Question from a tenant in Bridge Vern, um, and is you know linking into the top priority being uh, get the repair right first time. There was a, a suggestion and might make for a discussion. It's probably more a comment, um, and I'll ask June to come back on this. There was a suggestion about call centre staff for repairs to go out with and speak with the workforce to understand what happened. I think it would help them understand why you reported a repair and more evaluation and feedback of a repair, expanding on the repair experience when it doesn't go well, or to have more understanding of why the repair is important. OK, good morning. Um, during, I think this is a very, very good comment, um, and I can advise that during 2018-19, all of our repairs advisors and our small admin team undertook shadowing with at least one trade person and a property inspector for at least a couple of hours up to a whole day. A couple of our trade staff also undertook a half day session in the repair centre, shadowing to hear all the calls coming in to see the full repair end to end journey. Covid restrictions have prevented this over the last year However, we will certainly look to reintroduce this for many of our new staff when it's safe to do so. Where it's possible and appropriate, we also undertake a lesson learned meeting to agree improvement actions and avoid a reoccurrence of any issues when we receive complaints. Our customer satisfaction on completed repairs for 2021 was 97.5%. And in terms of right first time, our percentage performance for 2021 was 94.65% against a Scottish average of 92.4%. Thank you. Okay, thanks, June. Um, I can see a question um, on the chat there, and I think it's um, how many new builds are to be done? Is that for 2021-22? Um, Nicola? Yeah, we, we have a target of 150 um, for every year that we're doing and um, working towards that. So we have a variety of um, new build projects that are already started on site and will deliver some new build properties 
uh, as they complete. We also have some new build sites that are about to come on stream um, in Methven and also within Perth at Fairfield, uh, so that they will work towards the target of 150 properties. Thanks very much for that, Nicola. Um, another one, as always, repairs and, and new builds always always gets the questions. Um, a query around um, why did the repairs send plumbers from Glasgow to Perth during lockdown? Jim. Um, hello, yes, just to clarify, um, the plumbers that we use are locally based plumbers. We generally always use our in-house plumbers first. We do, however, have a drainage contractor um, our drainage contractor is called DAM, D-A-M-M. -M. Um, so I'm assuming that they are Glasgow based. So um, that would be the contractors that are referred to in that question, I think. Sorry, I was having difficulties unmuting myself there. <laughs> um, Is there any other um, questions? There's another, there's another one come in, Michelle, follow up from June about DAM, D A W M, um, about fixing the drains, um, saying that can't cannot fix the drains. I'm not sure in what respect that is. That's uh, from, from Trisha, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> She's typing away. I think maybe. Um... I would need to take that up separately okay. if, there's a, if there's a specific issue in relation to the block where um, Trisha stays, then I can certainly look into okay. that. Yeah, personally. And I see she's saying they've been there twice. They were back on yeah. the 22nd. So I will follow up on that and let you know yeah. that. I... Okay, thank okay. you, Jen. Sorry, I'm just being told that there's questions further up. Yes, there is, yes. There's um, the very first bit, um, Michelle, there was a question from Dave's, uh, from, sorry, from someone about council funding. Um, yes, so I can see it there. Yeah, it's got it there. Just a general question on council funding mm -hmm. in general. Is the council lobbying local and national politicians to increase funding across the board uh, and to maintain all public services? I'm a bit out of touch and don't know even if COSLA still exists to lobby Holyrood and Westminster. So Claire Mailer's got her hand up. So I think maybe Claire's wanting to answer that. Yes, thank you, Dave, for your question. I think I'll just I'll give a brief answer. In the first instance, yes, COSLA does still exist. For those of you that don't know, COSLA is the convention of Scottish local authorities. So it's it's a board that's a has representation from all 32 local authorities across Scotland uh, where views uh, and opinions and consultations are undertaken and COSLA will represent uh, all 32 lo local authorities uh, when presenting uh, information to the, the Scottish Government. So for example, just today we have had uh, some papers through for the COSLA Community Wellbeing Board uh, that is being held tomorrow. Um, Councillor Barrett is our representative on that board uh, and the Community Wellbeing Board is the one that covers housing issues. So I understand that tomorrow there are a number of areas uh, that will be discussed which include employability, child poverty uh, and interestingly uh, the right to adequate housing and some information around and about gypsy travellers accommodation. So yes that board does still exist and there are opportunities for uh, feedback to be channeled through uh, through the COSLA board. So that was a, an interesting question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, just in case anyone's missed it, I'll just go through some of the other questions which have been answered in the chat. So there was a question of how many houses do we uh, now have or the council have? Um, and June's responded to that saying that as at 31st March uh, 2021, we'd 7,680. Um, another question um, from Dave, how many houses did the council have before the Thatcher's Housing Act and the opening up of all council houses being up for sale to individuals or groups? I'm trying to think back, to be honest. <laughs> I've answered that. It's 17,000. Okay, there you go. 17,000 is the answer. 
Oh, yeah, you've answered it. Sorry, Jim. My apologies. I'm catching up in the, the chat. We've covered the new build. We've talked about the repairs. Um, another question from Dave. How is the council coping with local and citywide projects such as new gas boilers, etc., when European funding is no longer an option? Is this putting extra pressure on funding from house rents? Don't know, Stephen? <laughs> I was going. To, I was going to mostly Nicola or that, but in terms of this, I'm not aware of any pressure. Obviously, the price of uh, supplies and that will will increase as we go on, but we're not seeing any significant pressure on on our on our budgets at the moment as a result of that. We're increasing any uh, rental increase, but that's something that we'll need to sort of keep an eye on as the months go on and react accordingly if need be. I don't know if Nicola or June has any more information they'd want to say on that. I can add to that, Stephen, but as you say, they haven't really um, added addition, much additional cost. We are getting feedback that the price of um, radiators will go up and the price of um, materials will go up in general. And we are seeing that coming through. But wherever possible, we will be making full use of any of the energy efficiency schemes where that we can tap into funding. So there's a heaps abs and there's equal three flex schemes um, and the warm homes discount initiatives that we do um, look at to, to try and um, deal with any any funding and get grants where we possibly can. OK, thanks, um, Stephen and Nicola. Um, Kevin's put on the uh, Lynn Palmer, you do your hand up wanting to ask a question. You need to remember and unmute yourself, Lynn. The little microphone. That's you. Is that it? Uh, yes, I had two or three uh, ideas. One for Nicola, but I don't think she, because the, the sound and the noise is under the Scottish Government direction. If I make a suggestion, there's no point because I can't make any progress. But I don't think young people should be put in a flat with high ceilings because they'll never be able to pay the bills and then they'd have to ask for help but I wonder how many of them don't won't ask for help to pay their utility bills if if the flats are a huge space and then they're heating the space above their heads as well because there's nothing to keep the heat that they're paying for down in their flat now I'm on the top floor so I get everybody else's heat and that's no good is it but, but that's just for Nicola. I haven't heard from Nicola before. I've got one for June. I don't know how many times I can ask a question. Is there do other you, people waiting? Do you want me to respond initially to the, the first part before you move on? No, to I June? don't need to. I don't need to, Nicola, because you just told me that it's all under, under you know, like this guidance which the council has to keep to. Can I ask one of June? Um. You see, you see, all the years, June, I lived in this flat in North Methven Street. I never, ever had a single problem with water getting away from my kitchen sink. So it, there was never any blockage and no smell. Now, since I had the new kitchen, maybe three years or four years ago, I think the council is fitting narrower pipes because uh, the water doesn't run away that well. And uh, sometimes there was, a, for a long time, there was a smell. And, you know, the plumber on the day, he said to me, you'll have to put a drop of bleach down every so often. And I thought, that's funny. I've never had to do that before. But I think the council, that with regard to the quality of refurbishments, the council must have picked narrower pipes so the water can't get away and then a blockage can begin. I don't think we would have... Um installed narrower pipes uh, pipes um, but we can certainly look into that i mean the the installation would be um in terms of the current guidelines um but i'm sorry to hear that you're having problems and um, that's certainly not what we would expect from a new um upgraded kitchen but we can look into that for you lynn well the plumber is coming on monday afternoon okay i'll follow up and find out what his findings are then Yes. Uh, who else is wait, waiting to ask the questions? Anybody? Just, yeah, there's 
some in the chat, Lynn. Yeah. So I'm going to come back and catch up with the ones on the chat and then we can come back to you. Um, so Trisha's asking, where is the EBI returning to complete work started not finished? I'll pick that up with the, the city team because the work should have been finished. Um, so I'll maybe get some details um, from you, Trisha, of what specific project it is. Uh, and I can chase that up and, and make sure that that gets missed, if that's okay with you. Okay. Um, thanks a minute. Right, Derek, I'm more concerned with yeah. external repairs. There's no contact as required with tenants and the use of EBIs. Yeah, that's correct, Michelle, yes. You hear me okay, yeah? Yeah, Michelle's on mute. All right, okay. Uh, because in tenant repairs, obviously, uh, obviously the contact has been made with the tenant. But with external ones, I've been told many times, the tenant doesn't have to be in. The external, the, the property inspector or the repairs person looks at the outside of the building, that's what's required. So you'll be catching up with those external repairs pretty quick. Can, can I answer that, Derek? Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly in terms of external repairs, you're absolutely correct, Derek. Um, we, you know, as an attempt not to disturb our tenants, we would carry out the inspection and then arrange for the repair without having to disturb you. Um, in terms of catching up with the repairs, I'll say a bit more about that um, later on when I do my presentation. But it's not, um, you know, whether a repair is internal or external will not necessarily mean that it will be reached quicker. It's more about the capacity that we have in our internal uh, repairs teams and our external contractors that we use. So it's basically we are trying to get through the backlog of repairs, um, you know, as quickly and fairly as possible, which doesn't necessarily mean it's the category of the repair that drives that. Well, that's fine. That's OK. I know we're all going through a bad time just now and we're doing the best we can. That's OK. Thank you. Thanks, June. Um, Trish has asked, does the council have plans on doing a restructure of how they deal with unruly neighbours? Um, we will continue to work in partnership with the, the Safer Communities team and respond to um, unruly neighbours or antisocial behaviour um, as quickly as we can. We've obviously, you will have seen in the feedback from the Rent Setting Priorities Survey that in terms of um, managing and improving the area and neighbourhood in which you live, that was a top priority. So that is certainly something, you know, we'll have a look at, but we do continue to work in partnership with our Safer Communities team. We do have additional powers recently in terms of being able to convert um, tenancies from full to short Scottish secure tenancies. Um, but we will continue to use every avenue open to us and we will have a look um, at our antisocial behaviour policies and procedures to ensure that, you know, we're doing as much as we can um, to avoid it happening in the first instance and where it does happen to be able to respond and tackle that quickly. Um, I don't see any other. Derek's got his Derek's hand up. OK, just what you're saying about ESB. Um, I'm aware that that's funded through the general fund. I know that there's a review of the charter uh, coming up very shortly. I'll put my name forward to sit on the panel for that. And we're trying to see if how that can actually change through the outcome set. Uh, but regarding ASB tenants, all the rest of it, that kind of stuff, is a bit, a bit difficult as we go, go down that path because it's generally funded by the gen general fund. Uh, we'll see how it happens when uh, other people speak on this panel. OK, thank you, Derek. Um, Scott's just uh, put on the chat there a link to the, the new web page on dealing with neighbour complaints, um, Trisha, um, which if you would want, if you want to take a look at that or if you need more information, please just get back in contact. Um, how long should a joiner stay in one's home after he's done the job for the plumbers? rather than stand at the door and complain if one goes through their hallway to check their house door is shut. I'm sorry, I'm not. 
I'm not really understanding that question. Um, can I just answer that? I would just say that um, as soon as they've completed the work, I would expect them to leave your property. If they are having to wait for the plumber to arrive to make sure that they have done the extent of work expected for the plumber to complete their repair, they can wait outside your property or wait outside in their van. But in general, as soon as they've completed a piece of work, they should then leave your property. OK, uh, Lynn. You've got your hand up. You're on mute, Lynn. On mute. Uh, to June, um, we did have the dam van in our uh, car park, in Drumhar car park once for a particular reason and they fixed it. But that, that huge lorry that goes round that you see on occasions putting a great big thick tube down a drain. Is that a council lorry? And will they do the drain, which is at the bottom of Drumhar car park, right round uh, to where the, the bollards are, where you walk under the archway. It's actually, I've been keeping my eye on it and it's full of water all the time. So there's a big blockage there. So firstly, Lynn, um, there's three parts to your question. The first one is it's not a council vehicle, um, certainly not a repairs council vehicle because we oh. don't have vehicles of that size. We don't do, we don't have the facilities or the skills to do drainage work. So that's why we have the contract with DAM. Um, DAM do have a very large van that does drainage work, uh, which is, sounds like what you've described. Um, so yes, it could possibly be their vehicle. Um, thirdly, in terms of the drain that you're referring to, we would have to check if that was in fact a council owned drain, if that was council land in the first instance. So I think the best thing would be to get um, one of the property inspectors out to have a look, um, contact you if they need to, and then we'll take it from there if there's an issue with that drain. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. OK, thank you. OK, anyone have any other questions or put a question up that we've, we've missed or, or overlooked? Oh, Lynn, time for a quick final one. Right, is Councillor Braun still there? Yes, I am. Sorry, oh, um, <laughs> somewhere uh, in the background. Yes, um, Councillor Braun, I've long wondered about the, an empty property, a huge empty property, which could be flats, and I must presume it's owned by the co-op. I think it's on um, the bottom end of Scott Street, opposite that shop where you can organise a TV aerial. And when you look up at it, it's just getting worse and worse. And it's been like that for many, many years. So there must be some problem um, it, with regard to what anybody is going to do with that building, because it could be flats, couldn't it? I don't. I must admit, I don't know the building myself. Um, I know Scott Street, but I can't can't think of myself. But I, I can understand what you're saying. Yes, I and mean, it could be. A if, you look up, if you look up at the wall, it's high up. You know, there's one of those stone. Um, sections which says co-op yeah i don't I, I know scott street i drive down it but i don't i don't know the building you're talking about but i mean these um, are buildings we, we could be looking at i'm sure we could do um yeah. I, I don't, chris do you know the building a bit better than i do i, I don't know but um yes i do know um the building you're on about um the problem is if it's if it's owner somebody owns it it's up to them as to what we do or what they do with the, the block and, and yes obviously flats would be an option um, but it's down to the owner of the building can we I buy it from the owner that i don't that, know that, i don't know it could be, obviously it's a funding situation so uh, we can i can ask Stephen if he might come up with something there but that's a uh, and that's a question of do they want to sell i mean i don't know if it's the carp that own it or if it's owned by somebody else and they lease it it all depends on if the carp lease it of course they've still got the lease on the problem Probably so it's not it's, it's a legal mar as well there i think but um uh, i mean we're not it's, it's an idea of course you're right it's a, a, a probably could be used definitely but um 
it's a funding issue and a legal issue there. I mean, I say, who owns it? Does the cop own it? And if they, if the cop own it, do they want to keep it? And I mean, I presume the cop's closed. Is that, I don't know. Or is that still running? No. The co-op's still running, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave's given us a wee bit of a, a history um, yeah. in terms of the building. <laughs> I, I too remember it when it was whatever, whatever every woman wants. Um, okay, um, just to, because I'm, I'm conscious of time, um, we've got another question from Tricia. Will we be notified of the upcoming work to be done on our properties for 21-22? Michelle, I've uh, put an answer to that. If um, there is planned maintenance or capital work, we will always advise in advance. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, well, if that's all the questions, um, the next proposal is that we all take a, a ten minute or ten minute comfort break um, to go and get a refreshment during which the video will be played. I'm wondering how we're going to know that everyone's back. Oh, here we go. Everyone I can see on camera's back, so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can see quite a few people back. So, um, welcome back to the second and final session um, of your tenant summer conference. I'm um, looking forward to uh, the, this uh, presentation and also uh, additional questions. Uh, we've had some very good questions today, and uh, you've kept us on our toes. So long may that continue with your participation. So I'm going to hand over to June McCall, um, Housing Service Manager, who's going to give you an overview of how we are working to tackle the backlog of routine repairs as a result of COVID-19. And then we'll break out into a question and answer session after that again about anything within June's presentation or just anything in terms of the earlier presentation as well. OK, so I'll hand over to June now. Good morning. The last 12 months or 12 to 15 months have been very challenging for our tenants, our staff and all council services. Can you go to the next slide, please, Kev? During the pandemic, we completely changed the way we work in your homes with robust COVID safety protocols, risk assessments and PPE. Restrictions meant, as you know, that we could only focus on emergency and urgent repairs, void repairs, and some extreme medical adaptations. Statutory service and maintenance work, for example, annual gas servicing also continued. As a reminder, we've created a video, which is on our website, about how we are working in your home during the pandemic to keep you and our staff safe. Kev, would you like to play that? Just takes a second to get loaded up, so bear with me. As we restart our repair service, the health and safety of our tenants and staff is our highest priority. The work will involve you allowing our trade staff into your homes. We know that many of you may be concerned about letting someone into your household at this time. And so, we have created some guidelines to reassure you about what we will do to keep you, your family and our staff safe. Importantly, we are asking you to keep two metres away from our colleagues at all times. Tell us in advance if your repair has got work so we have the materials to complete the job in one visit. Tell us if you have COVID-19 symptoms, are self-isolating or shielding. Stay in another room if possible. Open all internal doors and keep all corridors clean. Reduce the spread of germs by covering your mouth and nose with a tissue if you cough or sneeze, or use the inside of your elbow. Wash your hands regularly for at least 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer. Allow our staff to wash their hands 
before and after carrying out any work, if you are happy for them to do so. We are also committed to keeping you as safe as possible when we are working in your home. We will ensure our staff are working only if they are fit and well to do so. Keep at least two metres from you and members of your household. Carry and use hand sanitizer. Wash our hands frequently in line with government recommendations. Always have the personal protective equipment we need. Minimise the number of visits it takes to complete a job when possible. Politely decline the offers of refreshments. Thank you for your understanding and cooperation. Thank you, Kev. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Yep, two seconds. That should be it there. There you go. The restrictions eased on the 26th of April 2021 which meant that we could restart non-emergency and non-urgent work in your home. Despite carrying out over 6,000 emergency and urgency repairs throughout the pandemic to date, a backlog of 929 non-emergency works orders across all trades has accumulated. The highest volumes of outstanding work are electrical, joinery, plumbing, including loan repairs and plaster work. We have agreed a strategy to complete this work in the quickest and fairest way. It is important that this work is completed as safely as possible whilst avoiding any further deterioration to your home, resulting in further emergency work. We also wrote to you all, letting you know about the backlog and our strategy to complete this work. Next slide, please. In terms of our strategy, we have agreed that the Repair Centre will continue to accept emergency and urgent repairs only until the backlog has been completed. We're continuing to complete all new emergency and urgency work whilst also working through the backlog of outstanding non-emergency work. We'll also continue to receive some new non-emergency and non-urgent work, and it will take several months for us to reach these new repair requests. All new non-emergency or non-urgent repairs should continue to be reported online. If you are vulnerable due to age or disability or do not have access to report a new non-emergency repair online, please continue to call the repair centre. Next slide. We've also included information on the repairs backlog on the website report a repair page. We will continue to update this information fortnightly going forward so you know how we are progressing and completing the backlog of repairs. We will update our automatic email response message to provide an update on progress with the outstanding repair work. We've issued elected members briefing notes and staff bulletins so everyone is kept up to date with progress and can help advise our teams. We are considering further how-to videos for any small repairs that some tenants may be able to undertake themselves. To date, we have 13 how-to videos on the website for small minor repairs for those who are able to do it themselves. And we've got another very short video with an example of the how-to video on there. Kev? I'm not good looking. Okay, that I'm not sure what happened there. It went to adverts instead of um, going on to the how-to video. But the how-to videos are all on the website if anyone wants to access them. And if there are any problems with that, please do let me know. How you can help us complete the backlog. 
if you have reported a non-emergency repair over the last 15 months, we will have a note of your repair and we will be in touch with you as soon as we can. Please do not call the repair centre to follow up on your repair. We are extremely busy and we will contact you as soon as we can to schedule your repair. Any new non-urgent repairs should be reported online using my PKC. Please only call the repair centre to continue to report emergency or urgent repairs. If you're unsure about emergency or urgent repair categories, a responsive repairs policy lists the work that falls into each of these repair categories. This is also available on the website. Next slide, please. Progress to date. On the 26th of April this year, our repairs backlog was 929 works orders. Now, each work or works order is not necessarily just one job. Some of them contain multi-trade work, for example, bathrooms or ceilings, and can be several jobs all rolled into one works order. To date, this has reduced to a total of 754 works orders outstanding. This includes a total of 160 works orders that have already been issued for completion. This means our current list of outstanding work not yet issued has now reduced to 594 works orders. I hope you'll agree that's good progress. Where possible, we are outsourcing multi-trade work, for example, major bathroom work and ceilings to our external contractors, meaning more complex repairs will only involve one contractor for our tenants to make contact with. Where possible, we are also combining multiple work within one property into one works order to avoid unnecessary or repeat visits. Next slide, please. I thought I'd take the opportunity just to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up shortly in terms of repairs. We're in the process of finalising the procurement of an electrical contractor to undertake electrical testing in all of our housing stock. This is a legal requirement similar to your annual gas safety check, but is only required every five years or on a change of tenancy. We hope to start these in July and we will be in touch with you as soon as possible to arrange a suitable time when your electrical safety check will be carried out. We're also involved in discussions about a possible project to install sensors in some homes. These record humidity levels and air quality. We hope this may lead to energy savings for some tenants and help us with the most appropriate solutions for tenancies experiencing condensation and related mould growth. If you would like to be considered for this project, please let me know or let us know by emailing the housing improvements at pkc.gov.uk. Next slide. Finally, we'd like to thank you all for all your continued patience and support throughout the last 15 months and going forward whilst we complete the outstanding backlog of non-emergency repairs. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, um, June. Um, a lot of good information in there. Um, so we now move um, to the final part of our session today, which is our second uh, Q&A session. Um, so I have one question here already, June, that someone sent in, and it probably links quite well to the difficulties you've been explaining to tenants in terms of the volume of work. But a tenant from Letter. Uh, noted that there was two empty council flats that weren't relet for eight months and their question is has there been an impact on the turnaround for void properties during lockdown because of not being able to refurbish for example because of furloughed contractors and is there a backlog of void properties as a result? So COVID restrictions have slowed down the process similarly as they have in normal responsive repairs safety protocols and limits on people moving house during lockdown one cause delays and also delays in receiving certain supplies and materials that we mentioned earlier. There is no backlog as such, but the volume of voids has certainly increased over the last few years. That's partly um, uh, can be attributable to the success of our new build programme, our buyback scheme and our rapid rehousing project. Year to date this year, from the 1st of April, we have completed 137 void properties in an average of 43 days. 
for the same period last year, we completed 128 void properties, so slightly less, in an average of 27 days. Overall, we've received 170 void properties to date this year, and in comparison to the same period last year, there was 126 voids. So, so far, for the first quarter of this year, we have had 45 more voids received than we had last year. So we certainly do have more voids coming in for a variety of reasons. And we do have some delays in terms of um, the safety protocols that are necessary. One of them in particular, when we receive keys for a void property, it's necessary for us to leave that property sitting for 72 hours, so three days before we access the property. This is to ensure there is absolutely no risk of transfer of the COVID virus. So there is some there is some impact on void properties to summarise. However, we don't have a backlog. We're pretty much where we expect it to be um, at this time of the year. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. There's a few more questions in the the chat. I don't know if you've seen Michelle. Oh, she's leaving. <laughs> uh, technical issues. Um, there was one about could frontline call handlers be trained more in mental health? Yeah, I can answer that. I'll refer back yeah. in. I think I know who who um, asked this question, and he wasn't here earlier. Um, yeah. Just to recap. During 2018-19, we did have um, all of our repairs advisors and admin, small admin team um, do some shadowing of trades staff and property inspectors. Likewise, some of the property inspectors and trade staff also spent some time shadowing in the repair centre. So everyone got a better um, understanding and experience of the end-to-end -end repairs journey. COVID obviously has prevented us from doing such close shadowing over the last year, but it is something that we'll certainly continue um, when it is safe for us to do so. In terms of mental health training, some of our teams certainly have had mental health training. That's a really good point, and it's something that I will take on board, and we will have a look and see what training is available um, and make a point of um, getting some of the repair centre staff, if not all of them, on refresher or further training for that. Okay. Thanks. Do you think Derek's got his hand up? Right, Trips. Um, no doubt you've heard this one before, obviously. As you will keep on saying, June, and this is your team, uh, you can get in touch with the, the team on the on website. Not everybody's on the website, not everybody's online. Not everybody still has their tenants' agreements. So not everybody knows what emergency repair is or an urgent repair. So your phone lines must be going crazy with phoning up the slightest wee problems and not understanding if they're urgent or emergency. Obviously, you've got a dialogue to actually tell them, but is, your phone lines must be going absolutely crazy regarding that. That's my question. Um, the phone lines certainly are very, very busy, Derek. Thank you for highlighting that. We still have a high number of people who are phoning in um, with a non-urgent repair. Um, if they are able to report it online, we have that conversation with them. If not, we will take a note of the repair and we'll keep that logged if it's a new repair or we'll advise them on progress if it's an existing one that we have. Um, we fully appreciate that um, quite a high percentage of our tenants do not have access to the website or the ability to report repairs online. Um, and we accept that those people, for whatever reason, will still be calling into the repair centre. Um, we are extremely busy, but we are doing everything that we can to answer calls and get through the backlog as quickly as we can. Okay. Thanks, Derek. Um, Trisha was asking about when is the telephones going to be fixed? Is that, Trisha, are you talking about the repairs phone line or is it your, your own phone line? If you just unmute, oh, you're typing. Just type. Okay. 
all phones in Perth and Kinross Council. She's asking when is the telephones going to be fixed for all phones in Perth and Kinross Council? We don't currently have any issues with the phone lines that we are aware of. Our, um, in terms of the repair centre, all our staff are um, either yeah. working from working in the office or working from home or doing a hybrid of both. But regardless of where they're located, they still have the same equipment and ability to answer calls. So we're not aware of any problems, but please do let us know, um, Trish, what that is, and we can certainly deal with um, She's just put it, so you've seen it in the chat, June. Um, ended up speaking to Balhousie School last week. Must have been. I'm not sure if there was a glitch on the phone line, but I'll certainly ask the question if there's been any issues and let you know. Okay. Okay. Do you know, get back to that one, Tricia. Um, just James, any more questions in the chat? Um, oh, thank you. That's Tricia just saying. Has anybody got any other questions? Hands up or type? Oh, there's another one just popped. Oh, oh, they're all coming up now. <laughs> um, oh, here's where's a there's one I could say. Uh, could we get more staff to just talk straight rather than beat about the bush? Also, could the staff all carry ID, please? Our staff um, should all be carrying ID. That's part of our processes. Yep. <laughs> Oh, Lynn's got her hand up. Yeah, Lynn. Regarding what Nicola was saying, <clears throat> when soon after we started, I suppose really I should have tried a bit harder. Just, uh, but you see, when when a tenant wants to put forward an idea, it could easily start as a pilot project. But it's like. All the staff do is say something like, oh, well, we have to follow guidelines from the Scottish government and, and your own guidelines, the council's guidelines. But it, isn't it possible for a tenant to ask for a pilot project? And like, because what can happen is when you say things like um, this is we're following government guidelines and this is the law at the moment and that sort of thing, it stops tenants from putting forward their ideas. I think it would be a better than if a tenant could be help, assisted to see that they can put forward their ideas, then they would ask for a pilot project. You'd have pilot projects going on all the time. So it's like empowerment. It means empowerment for people. Um, I totally agree with you, Lynn. Um, what I would say is we absolutely welcome any suggestions from all of our tenants. If it is something, I mean, I mean, that's the very basis of the EBI projects um, that I see that Michelle's had to leave, but um, she will be able to expand on that. But um, okay. if there's something that we can bring into a project, we're very, very grateful for any suggestions and we'll do what we can to facilitate that. OK, in that case, I'm asking for a pilot project to lower the height of flats with high ceilings. And then you can put your insulation in, can't you, Nicola? Yes, we can put insulation in. We can yeah. also look at other other measures. We can yeah. put in other acoustic um, materials that help to absorb the, the any noise transfer. We are doing a, looking at a pilot at the moment in some flatted properties, but they're, they're not as high ceilings, but there is issues with sound transfer between two sets of flats and we are looking at that at the moment to see what the issues are and what we can do to resolve it. In a building that's over 100 years old, they've uh, apart from the top floor, which doesn't have high ceilings, that's my flat, these these old buildings have got 12 foot walls. The height of a wall is probably about 12 feet. Well, why would you heat all that air above your head? And it, and it also filter through into the flat, the next flat, then the next flat. You know, like you could, there's plenty of room to put in a false ceiling and then you can add your insulation. Now that's a pilot project, isn't it? 
yes there, there yes. is the potential to be able to there is the potential to be able to do that um we would have to look at it again on a, a block by block basis because there may be other reasons why we can't do it but those would be looked at when we did look at it as a project okay i'm okay. holding you to it <laughs> okay then apologies that uh, that's me back now so I'm, I'm just catching up but um i can see there in the the chat um a question around uh, is the council going to cage off the high flats at pomerium june or nicola that was for Nicola and the multi-story refurbishment. Yes. No, there, there is no intention to cage off the, the, the high flats at Pomerium. We do have works planned. Um, we're developing a multi-story strategy to look at the external appearance of the building and improve the energy efficiency, look at the, the balconies and look at the walkways. But the, there is no intention to cage off any of the high flats um, walkways but again we will be doing some um, consultation on that once we are further down um, the road with the multi-story strategy. Okay thanks Nicola. Uh, are there any other questions or questions that have been missed that somebody's not had an answer to? Yes. Tommy have you got a question? Yeah Tommy. I haven't heard Tommy down here. Sorry? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. It's a little bit distorted. Um, uh, I had to get to the actually had to rejoin the video now, so I don't know what's going to that. Uh, I have assumed that on the agenda, that there's the other half that we've been talking about, you know, uh, questions on the purse. Sorry, I'm, I'm not under, I didn't understand. You're not that. understand it. Is there any way, Tommy, you could type it in the chat? Well, I've already wrote the, the questions in, so I'm surprised that nobody brought them up. Tommy sent, sent questions in, um, but he's surprised that no one brought them up. Um, he is referring to the, I can stop here a bit, <laughs> the Thanks. second part with the questions and answers. Do you want to try, Tommy, and I'll translate for you? Right, okay. Okay. Please it. Uh, one of the inspectors come out for the look at different repairs that were required. Can you hear me? Three different inspectors for three different repairs. Right. Yeah. I had pointed out that the manholes at the back of the house are not hermetically sealed. And it's actually a breach of the built regulations. It can also cause typhoid. The four inches of gap in some of these uh, covers, and they're not appropriate covers. So that needs to be looked at immediately. Okay. I have called a child looking into the gap. Okay. What? Are you um... Okay, I can hear you a little bit. I think we might have to contact you separately because it really is distorted. I'm actually writing to, to, uh, to the council because there's other matters that need to be looked at as you can't hear me. Okay, we've got your contact information, Tommy. What we'll do is we'll get someone to give you a call after the um, conference, if that's okay, about your three questions. Um, because I am getting bits of it, but we don't want to lose out on anything. So we'll, we'll right. get in contact with you. Okay, sorry about that. It really it's, is. It's probably my way. computer, you know, uh, but. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, we'll get someone. To it's about repairs. Okay, no problem. We'll get someone to contact you. Sorry about that. Uh, That's okay. Uh, thank uh, you. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. Sorry. That's it. We'll get someone to contact Tommy after this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, I can see a suggestion in the box there in the chat from Gavin. Could the housing repairs manager or team leader not do more of these meetings, say, every three months? Um, well, we wouldn't be doing a full tenants conference every three months, but um, we can certainly um, have a chat with you, Gavin, every three to six months to see 
I think you're in touch with us quite often anyway, as it is. OK, um, so yeah, June's point is, um, yeah, we have two of these conferences, um, one in summer and one in autumn to look at the rent setting. Um, so yeah, we wouldn't be repeating this every sort of three months. So, but we can, we, you know, we can hopefully keep in regular contact. Um, Trish has come back and said, when I say cage off, I mean the landings of the flats. I think you said uh, that we have yeah. no intention of doing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know there's potentially concerns with regards to the incident that happened recently, uh, but the, the height of the barriers there um, do comply with the regulations. Um, so if that we also have to consider what appearance that also gives to the, the landings in terms of um, not making them institutional. Um, but yeah, I, I can understand the, the concerns that are being raised. OK, is there any, I uh, see your comments there, Gavin, thank you. Um, is there any other questions? Last opportunity. No, I can't see any hands anyway, virtually otherwise, apart from obviously Tommy's, but we'll get back to him and those. OK, OK. Um, well, if that that's everything, you know, um, then that brings us on to the, the closure of the conference. Um, I'd just like to thank every single one of you on behalf of the housing management team for taking the time out to come along today um, for your participation um, and your excellent questions. I think we managed to answer um, all of them. I think we've maybe got one that we've maybe got to get back to. Um, as I say, we would be really interested, though, to uh, get your feedback in terms of the new way in which we delivered the conference. So that is in relation to the pre-conference presentation that went out in advance to give you the opportunity to think of questions and submit questions and also just how you felt today went, what went well and um, what didn't go well. Because I think when we move um, back into some form of a normal life, I think, you know, if we want to truly ensure that as many tenants as possible can participate, then we need to continue to deliver the absolutely face to face uh, conferences. But we also need to support people being able to be digitally included. Um, I think one of the benefits in terms of doing the pre-conference presentation was that you got to watch the video and listen to it at a time that suited you and you could listen to it more than once instead of you know coming to the conference and then just getting hit with the information on on the day to an extent a lot of it more information so we'd really welcome your feedback so um i'm going to ask my colleagues and um, i haven't told them this yet i'm going to ask my colleagues in trp if they can maybe they will have all your contact details and maybe get some feedback from you absolutely both positive and negative what worked a lot better um so yeah uh, once again, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. The weather looks as though it's going to hold off. And hopefully we all look forward to being able to see you in person again soon. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's supported the conference today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.